It's confession time. I'm ready to spill the beans. Like you, I've been really excited to see the first batch of pieces of the new worldwide hymnal the church has been working on. But boy, oh boy, have there been a lot of opinions flying around about these pieces. I've, it's been really fun to see all the commentary and different opinions. But I think some are getting their feelings hurt by the way some of us are talking about these new selections. And so as a semi-recovered LDS music snob who honestly still struggles with his snobbishness tendencies, I'll admit, <clears throat> like sort of like a recovering alcoholic may be struggling with their natural tendencies, I thought I'd share some thoughts, some questions, and some ideas that I really hope can be helpful. So thought number one, my confession. I used to be the biggest raging music snob you could possibly imagine. I admit it, guilty as charged. I'm sure that some who know me would say that I'm still a raging snob. Well, fair enough. <laughs> it's true. When I'm making music, when I'm composing my music, when I'm conducting a choir or an orchestra, I, I have very high standards. I've been blessed to have a lot of high-level music training, which informs my music-making decisions. It's been a joy to get to study very deeply a topic that I love so much, a topic that fills me with so much joy. Of course, as I studied, I formed my own opinions about the quality of music and quality in music. And sometimes when I'm making music, if I'm not careful, my strong opinions can come across as very snobbish. The trouble is... At a certain point in my musical education, these opinions grew into a my way or the highway kind of attitude. And honestly, looking back, I feel pretty ashamed about that. Something happened to me that turned it all around. When I was in Poland studying at the Chopin University of Music as a Fulbright scholar, I had an amazing opportunity to write a big Catholic mass for one of the major churches in Warsaw. My teacher was their music director, and we performed my Mass many times, including during a special ceremony that was broadcast on national television and radio. It was a pretty big deal, and I felt pretty special, to be honest. But after the service with a packed cathedral, this humble little Polish priest came to me to tell me something. My friend translated as he said, Mr. Pugh, I wanted to thank you. Your music helped me to pray today. Sounds simple, but this was a lightning bolt experience for me. It struck me very deeply, and it helped me remember that music, it's not about me. Music is about giving and communicating and uplifting. From that moment on, I've really tried to focus my musical activities on serving and blessing others rather than aggrandizing myself. Which leads me to something I think we should all remember with the advent of the new hymnal. It's the First Presidency's preface to the 1985 hymnal, which says, Inspirational music is an essential part of our church meetings. The hymns invite the Spirit of the Lord, creating a feeling of reverence, unifying us as members, and providing a way for us to offer praises to the Lord. Some of the greatest sermons are preached by the singing of hymns. Hymns move us to repentance and good works, build testimony and faith, comfort the weary, console the mourning, and inspire us to endure to the end. Now, I don't think any of us would argue with this statement. For me, as a creator of music, as a composer myself, this means that I should do all I can to focus my musical efforts when I'm creating music for worship services, to focus on creating music that uplifts others, above all. How I do that may be very different from how you do that, or from how others do that, which is okay, and which leads me to my next question. So thought number two, which is a question. Are some styles of music better than others in our church worship services? This is a big question, and it's one of the big questions that's been causing a lot of hurt feelings flying around. I've seen a bunch of people even leaving LDS Music Facebook groups because of all the contention on there. We don't need that. Let me tell you about a friend of mine. One of my favorite music friends in the church is Shauna Edwards. Actually, we live in the same stake. 
As you probably know, Shauna has written many beautiful, meaningful, inspiring songs that are sung around the world by many people. I believe her songs do exactly what the First Presidency message prescribes. That being said, Shauna and I write in very different styles. Is my style better than hers? Is her style better than mine? Honestly, I think that's the wrong question. I think the question should be, did our music draw people closer to Heavenly Father? How she does that may be very different from how I do that in my old school classical kind of way. And in my opinion, that's not only okay, it's really good for us. Why? Because when we're open to other ways of thinking, other ways of expression, and other ways of communication, we grow together. It's like the Doctrine and Covenants says, that all might be edified of all. Of course, we want our music to be appropriate for a worship service, which is a topic that can be a big old can of worms. But at the end of the day, I personally do not believe one style is technically better than the other. I do believe that I have certain experiences in my life with my music that have brought me personally higher emotionally and spiritually, not that I'm more spiritual or emotional than others, but that have given me emotional and spiritual experiences that are greater than any others that I have felt in my life outside of being in the temple. For me personally, these experiences come from a very specific type of music. But I'll be the first to admit that those styles of music may not do a darn thing for someone else. There are many styles of music that don't do a darn thing for me. But I think we should be open and accepting of styles that differ from ours. And we should look on the intent of the heart of the creator of that music instead of only on the style. Will this change the style of the music I write? No, probably not. Will it change the style Shauna writes in? Probably not. And that's fine, because I learn things from Shauna's music. I may use them in different ways, but hey, that's fine. Plus, let's be honest, who am I to speak against the massive following Shauna has on her millions of YouTube views? I don't have that. She does. And I love it that she does. Thought number three. This might be a hard one, but... Let's be kind to the snobs. Speaking as a snob, <laughs> struggling to reform snob, I'd like to ask those who are feeling frustrated with our snobbery for a little patience and a little grace. Here's the thing. Most of, my, most of us mean well. We really do. We're just so caught up in a style of music that has given us some incredible gifts in our lives that it's really hard sometimes to accept anything that doesn't take us to those same places emotionally. For us, it's like the experience of being hooked on waxy American chocolate all our lives, thinking it's the best because, hey, it's chocolate, right? Oh, but then the first time we taste Swiss chocolate or Belgian chocolate or Ukrainian chocolate, oh, mama, our world changes. Our eyes have been opened. We can never go back to that waxy old American chocolate again. This is how a lot of us look at our musical journey. And in becoming addicted to this Swiss chocolate kind of music, we forget that many people don't like Swiss chocolate and maybe never will. And again, that's perfectly okay. Plus, many of us have spent years and years, even decades, devoting our lives to the study of highbrow classical music. We've become specialists. We've tried all things. We've found lots of ways to make music soar to higher heights for us than other types. Again, for us. We've given huge chunks of our lives over to this study of music. So naturally, our opinions run really strong, and they can easily get the better of us. We're really not trying to be jerks. We just care so much. We really, really do. Because we've lived inside the incredible power of music for a long time. We've dedicated so much of our lives and our money and our time and our love to music. So please, 
On behalf of all the snobs, reformed or otherwise, please be patient with us. We really do mean well. We just need to do a little better about how we express it. Which leads to thought number four. Okay, snobs, fellow snobs, I have a plea. Let's do better. I used to get so worked up about certain types of music in the church. I'd get all up in arms. Certain things would drive me nuts. Certain things still do drive me nuts. But I'm trying really hard to realize that there are many more important things than the notes on the pages of our music in church. Of course, we all know that there are more important things than music in the church. But it can be easy to forget that, as a teacher of mine taught me, we do not worship at the altar of music. We worship at the altar with music. So let's do a little better. <clears throat> let's find ways to be more careful with our words because words can bite. Should you change your opinions? Personally, I don't think you necessarily have to change your opinions. I think you're entitled to your opinion. But I also believe that you shouldn't be rude or demeaning about your opinion. What good will it do? Will that help us be peacemakers? Will that do anything to heal contentions? Part of the magic of music is that it can unify us. One of the only things we do in church that actually physically unites us as one is we sing the hymns together. We breathe together as we sing. Our voices praise the Lord in unison together. And actually, when that happens, based on a lot of scientific studies that have been done on choirs and groups who are singing, our hearts literally start beating together as we breathe together and as we sing together. That's so beautiful. So let's remember that. And, you know, fellow struggling to reform snobs, <laughs> let's use music to come together rather than to divide. I think the worst thing that can happen with regard to the new hymnal is the creation of an us versus them mentality. Maybe our opinions will never agree 100%, but that doesn't mean we need to have contention. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> remember, if you are not one, ye are not mine. That's kind of a scary statement. And we don't want music to divide us. Thought number five. It's another question. Are there fundamental principles of music making that should be adhered to in our worship music? Now, this thought may found very, sound very subjective, and perhaps it is, but I'm going to ask that you hear me out. For me personally, it's a matter of good, better, best. Personally, I'm open to many different styles of music in the church. A lot of people aren't. I am. I'm okay with several different styles. Yes, I personally like some of those styles more than others, but that doesn't mean that the others should be cast out. What I feel very strongly about, however, is that whatever style you write in, that you write well, that your musical grammar is as good as it can be. And we may disagree on what good musical grammar is, and honestly, I think that's okay, too. But I think we can strive in any music that we create to write it as well as possible. Now, <clears throat> maybe you're very new uh, to writing music. That's great. Welcome. I'm so glad you're being brave and sharing your testimony through music. Few things are as rewarding. I encourage you on your quest to learn as much as you can about the fundamental principles of good music writing. Again, those may be subjective, but there are so many sources you can go to. You can connect all sorts of ideas of what's happening in modern music back to the ancient geniuses who mastered these techniques like Bach and others. I encourage you to learn as much of those fundamentals as you can. Uh, 
there are certain ways of connecting notes that cause music to sound more resonant, more warm, more delicious. And since our goal is to write music that brings us closer to God, I personally believe we should learn how to use the types of music writing that create the most resonance as possible when we're writing worship music, music for sacrament meeting. If you were asked to write an article for the Leahona magazine or the Friend magazine, but it was filled with all sorts of grammatical errors, don't you think they'd ask you to fix those errors? Probably. But you might say, oh, but that's my style of writing. I just write that way. Why can't you just accept my style of writing and be okay with it? That's a troubling thought for me. For me, it's like the comment Joseph Smith made. I teach them correct principles, and they govern themselves. I believe we all need to learn the grammar of music and then use it in whatever style we're writing in to the best of our abilities. When I teach my students in my Latter-day Museversity, that's what I call my little online music teaching world, where I teach primary songwriting and hymn arranging and others, I do my very best to teach my students the principles of great music writing, the best of musical grammar. I never impose my style on them. My goal is not to make them versions of me. My goal is to always help them become better versions of themselves. I give them examples of different ways of creating music based on what they're trying to accomplish emotionally, and I let them decide which to use. I won't get too deep into this because, honestly, it's a never-ending debate. I just want to say that in whatever medium of creativity you are writing in, going to the fundamentals, to the masters, and learning all you can about the best forms of writing is never a bad idea. You don't have to use those principles in the same ways that people do from the past, but I believe it's important to work to raise the bar as much as we can in our worship music at whatever level you're writing at. And ignoring principles of good musical grammar, whatever style you're in, I believe is a mistake. My final thought, another confession. <clears throat> Why, and it's all about why I've decided to make these reviews to each of the new hymns that are coming out in the hymnal. My purpose is not to poke or prod or preach or demean or demand or any of that. One of the greatest joys of my life now is teaching my students to write emotionally powerful, testimony filled music. I do it in a certain way. You would, might do it in a different way, and I think that's okay. But let me illustrate how this is working. I want to tell you about a student of mine. She's very new to writing music. She's only been writing for a little over a year. And when she started, she was very nervous. She never in a million years believed that she could write anything, let alone anything good. Since that time, she's written a handful of truly beautiful, meaningful, testimony-filled primary songs. Here's what she said. Writing primary songs has changed my life and brought me so much joy. Words are completely inadequate to express the deep gratitude I feel to the Lord and to you for the blessing of being your student. I had never imagined the possibility of learning to write music, so this opportunity is a wonderful surprise. I wake up every morning thinking about the song I'm working on, and although I'm rarely sad or discouraged, when I am, playing the songs I have written has brought me the most comfort. Writing scripture-based songs is an incredible way to do deep scripture study. That brings me so much joy to hear this. It's tremendous. I absolutely love helping my students turn their testimonies into song. If I had been a jerk about it, if I had been my way or the highway, this would be impossible. And so while I may have certain strong opinions about what good musical grammar is, I accept that that might not work for you. And it might not work for others. You may prefer another way. And at the end of the day, that's okay. I still want to encourage you to find out the best forms of grammatic music making that you can. I am personally on a mission to help as many as I can to leave their testimony legacy to their families because music has an incredible magical way of conjuring up powerful feelings. And years after my students leave this earth, 
their families can sing their songs and immediately conjure up the testimonies and the feelings of love that connected them to each other. That is so special. And so by reviewing these hymns and songs as they come out, my goal is to be helpful. I want to point out the techniques of good writing. And if I notice things that, from my point of view, could have done, been done in a better way, a way that could possibly be more resonant, I'm going to point them out, but not to tear down, rather to show that there are alternative ways of expressing the same emotion in a more musically grammatical way. So, to wrap this all up, I hope... That even though we have lots of emotions and opinions and feelings about the new hymnal, that we can all be supportive of each other and do our best to see both sides of the pancake. And if you've ever wished you could turn your testimony into song, I'd love to help you. You can take a look at the description box below and find some free resources there. And come back to the channel, hit subscribe, ring the bell so you can get more of these videos. I'll do my very best to be as helpful and kind as I can. Thanks very much. I'll see you next time.